Seamus, welcome to Dingle. Thank you for having me. Now, your book is one of those ones where the title kind of gives away probably the most dramatic event to the book, but if you might explain to us what <laughs> happened to you when you were five years old. Um, you'll never guess. Yeah. Um, but when I was three weeks shy of my sixth birthday, uh, my mother died, um, and she left behind her 11 kids um, who were raised entirely with my dad uh, in the countryside uh, on the Derry Donegal border. So from 1991 until, well, so he's still raising, I suppose, in a way. Um, yeah, he was left in 1991 with 11 kids between the ages of 2 and 17. And the title itself refers to the fact that because I was so young, I didn't really understand uh, the permanence of death. Um, this is mostly due to a lack of practice in the world of losing people and grief. Um, but nevertheless, it was still quite traumatizing for people to witness me standing in front of the door as I did waiting for people to come in um, horrified mourners to my mother's wake uh, stretch out my hand and with a very cheerful disposition say did you hear mommy died um, so the book basically charts me dealing with that grief and the dynamics of a big family and just all of the aspects of my life that followed it's obviously a terribly tragic event, but it's also one that not only in that moment, but throughout is extremely funny, as well as being very sad. And obviously being one of 11 children, you had quite a cast of characters in your family. But for a book where your mother is in the title, in many ways it becomes a book, not just obviously about yourself, but also about your father and what he was left to do um, after his wife passed away. And he emerges as kind of a larger than life figure in many ways. But like, what was that like uh, having a father who dealt with 11 different children and only being one eleventh of his <laughs> offspring. Yeah, and he was an only child as well, so worked that one out. Um, very strange. Maybe he was just so bored and lonely on his, on his own growing up that he decided he was going to give the birth registry premature arthritis <laughs> man for man. Um, yeah, I mean, my dad's an incredible character. Um, in the first instance, obviously, he's... Uh, a wonderful, caring father, a very ingenious dad. Uh, he's an engineer by trade, but now retired. <clears throat> so he's quite practical. So an awful lot of the things he had to do as a parent were, you know, would be enough, a lot for two parents. Um, you know, at one point, when he was 50, he had six teenage daughters at once. Six of his seven daughters were teenagers. Um, and as I say in the book, you know, I can't imagine what that was like. And I was literally there. <laughs> uh, it's a terrifying thought. It's, yeah, just like loads of doors being slammed. Um, just an awful lot of very, very confusing uh, behavior. Uh, you couldn't use the toilet without a two-week appointment. Um, yeah, things were obviously very challenging just in the logistics, uh, but also on the emotional side. You know, he had to fulfill a mother's and a father's role. And also to do so at a time when you know, the softer side of parenting was not maybe a big thing in the male curriculum. Yeah. Um, certainly not for rural Irish men of a certain vintage. This was not a natural um, or easy task. Um, now obviously, for some of your older brothers and sisters, they had lots of memories of your mother because they were older when she died. But you were only five years old. And one of the things that I found really striking when reading your book was how you mentioned that when you started, you only had a handful, I think five memories of your mother but that the process of writing the book actually allowed you to recover more of those memories? Yeah, and it, it, I don't want to make it seem more romantic than it was. I literally had five memories written in a spreadsheet. <laughs> because it was the only way. I had loads of different things I wanted to talk about in the book, and things that I thought would be funny and things I thought would be, you know, explain where I'm coming from. Um, and, you know, there's obviously a lot of material. It's a whole life, and it's just thematically, there's loads of things to talk about. And I knew going in that I had five memories because that's since I was about 12, I just knew I had the five memories. And uh, I originally had, the first time I was ever asked to do this, when I was eight, I had 10, and I wrote them down. And mm. the sadness at eight of realizing I only had 10 memories was like a second bereavement. And then you'd think that that would cement those 10, but the next time I tried, I had five. And the piece of paper that had the 10, I mean, I would give any amount of money on God's earth to have that piece of paper that I wrote erase, that has 10 memories, which I was so disgusted that I only had 10. So memory is a huge part of the book and it's a huge part of 
the process of trying to work out what you actually remember, what you have just heard the stories told so many times. So the three extra memories, for example, that came up, which I go into in the book, they're not particularly uh, magnetic, you know? I mean, as I say in the book, I don't remember being told that my mother was dead, but I remember my first taste of a banana sandwich. Yeah. You know? Why? Who's doing the filing? What's the... The bureaucracy here the is... The filing shot. is very interesting because uh, one of the things that you mentioned, you know, you do go through this process of kind of excavation, of going back and talking to people who knew your mother, people who knew your father, who have more memories than you did. And there's wonderful moments of, you know, them and your dad constantly saying, because they knew you were writing the book, you know, I suppose you'll be putting this in the book now whenever <laughs> any detail comes up. But you also mentioned the fact that your dad did kind of a, have a, 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 a filing process himself in his uh, his VHS tape archive. Yes. Um, which sounds like it was extraordinarily extensive. But something you say about his huge collection of videos was that maybe that archive was some kind of way of putting order on chaos, this chaotic life that he not only was living with himself as a father, widowed father of 11 children, but also growing up, obviously, or raising those children in Northern Ireland that was a very traumatic place. And I wonder, like, di those kind of discoveries that you make as, you, as you're almost like a historian of your own family in some ways digging stuff up like was that a very difficult experience like to separate the emotional from what's you know I'm actually trying to write a book here um no but only because I probably didn't separate it because okay. I'm, I'm I don't have much integrity so <laughs> uh, I I always went in for if possible you know I would I would bend the elasticity of a story and you know you mentioned about having people having their own recollections. Like, I have 10 brothers and sisters, so in some way, you might imagine, oh my God, this is amazing, you've got 10 external hard drives. And it often is like that, I, things that I do not want to remember. I've got 10 people who will tell me exactly what I was wearing, what I was doing, you know, everything. They'll, they'll give you every embarrassing moment, they'll give you every misspoken word, every ill-advised decision. It's in their film of memory forever, even if I try and suppress it. But sometimes you'll ask them about something. Oh, we went on holiday and there was a kid that was stung by a bee and someone, everyone, nobody knew CPR, so everyone just got down and prayed. One person in my family remembered that. Three said it had to happen. It happened in Wales. Four more said it happened in Mosny. So you're like, at some point you start having to make these decisions um, about how you put it down. And in the book, I have comment on that and I say that this has happened. Um, and generally, you kind of try and form around a consensus because I don't want my family to think I'm a complete fabulist, yeah. just a slight fabulist. <laughs> um, but the memory is so, it's so shaky and strange, and also it can be quite overwhelming. Um, so I think what you said there about my dad's VHS tape collection, that's a very good example of, of exactly that, trying to substitute the chaos of ordinary normal problems with creating an incredibly linear and specific problem, <laughs> which is, recording for free every single video and movie that's on TV. Um, and I do the same myself. When I was making this book, I had so many clips and newspaper articles and things that my dad had told me and recordings. And I, if I didn't want to dig into the deep stuff someday, some days you just, I don't know if I can write about this. Mm -hmm. I would just go into my little folder and I would alphabetize things and I would move things around and say, oh, I should probably save that. Oh, I'll put that in the cloud. Some some strange order from chaos, uh, even if it is a very prosaic process, can sometimes settle the tumult yeah. of slightly bigger concerns. And of course, the bigger concerns, there was chaos behind all of this because you grew up in Derry at a time when obviously it was a daily occurrence that there would be some type of terrorist event or run-ins with the police. And these were things that you and other people in Northern Ireland at that time simply just grew up with as a matter of course. And I wonder, you know, it's not the focus of your book but it runs in the background as this kind of slightly disquieting hum all the time. And you mentioned one memory of your mother squeezing your hand mm. during a bomb scare as one of the things that you <coughs> do remember. Like, it, you haven't written a book about the troubles and there is always <laughs> like a, a danger when you talk to people like me from the South or people from Britain or, or elsewhere that everything in Northern Ireland gets kind of essentialized down to talking about the troubles. But at the same time, the background of this amazing family story that you lived was the fact that that <laughs> yeah. was a real part of daily life. Like, is that something that you found traumatic to go and revisit? Um, like, no, not really, because it was, I don't feel like I've been away from it to, to revisit it. It's, I mean, 
the weird thing is that some of the examples, which I find very banal, shock people when they hear them. So f people of my generation, I'm 35, so I was still, I was just entering secondary school around the time the peace agreements were really kind of bearing fruit. So ceasefire babies, I believe, is Lyra McKee um, uh, kind of coined, coined the term. And, you know, people my age and younger probably quite often preface these kinds of conversations by saying, well, well, you know, we didn't have this bad and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Especially when, as you allude, you're talking to people from the South or people from England who, you know, have just watched the sad song bits and reading in the ears. Yeah. And so they think that maybe they, they know, you know a little bit more uh, from a very, very, very small pocket of information. Um, but that's leaving out the fact that we had the checkpoint run every day where, you know, mustachioed British soldiers with dogs would place, you know, a, the stick with the, the mirror under my dad's minivan, carrying 11 children, just to make sure he hadn't put explosives under his 11 children. And that was every single day. Um, there were bomb scares, marched up, being marched off buses. And also there was an explosion uh, right in front of our house. So when we say we live on the border, we literally live on the border. So my dad's fence, I did the maths, Another thing I did when I didn't want to be writing a book, and my dad's fence, which he erected to keep a horse away from his rose bushes, uh, the horse is a Donegal horse and they're famously um, voracious. Um, that fence that he put up is 0.04% of the boundary between the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. And it is now 0.04% of their border with the European Union. Yeah. So those kinds of things, <sighs> Growing up, you don't think about them. It's just the fence that keeps the, d the horse away. Even though there was a custom saw at the top of that road, literally about as far away as the back wall, which exploded in 1988, depositing a wall with sink still attached. Uh, unfortunately, it wasn't. It was from a toilet, but it didn't. It wasn't a toilet, and I couldn't stretch. This you tail. can just make that up to make it, it slightly sexier. Such, it wouldn't be great. Um, but it was smouldering. It was a smouldering sink, um, and I. It, this was deemed so insignificant that A, I wasn't told about it until I was like 15 or 20. I don't even remember being told. And I was astonished and amazed. And I said, oh yeah, well, sure, it was fine. The windows rattled for a bit and we went and stayed with your grandfather. Um, and the Derry Journal, I have the clipping. It's from four days later. It gets a two line mention on page 13 with like 11 other bombs that happened that were deemed more important than the bomb that hap to ha happened to happen on our road. And you know, in the book, maybe perhaps because I'm so self-obsessed, you know, I drew a comparison there, wanting to, wanting to find your way among 11 other uh, individuals, be they bombs or siblings. Um, yeah, that's kind of... What Even I though you were a child, I mean, you mentioned, like, the fact that as a child you notice how adults deal with these kind of traumatic things. I mean, not just how adults around you dealt with the fact that, you know, your mother, their friend or wife or sister or cousin or whatever died, but also they were dealing with this daily threat in a way that you know, was obviously terrifying to them, but also something that you don't want to sort of terrify the children of. You have a story in there of a friend of your father's who worked in a meat processing facility and about how the men who worked in there, who came from both sides of the divide, to use the cliched, yeah. horrible uh, term, you know, used to make very, very dark jokes to each other about you know, punishment killings, bomb scares, and so on, in a way that like the slagging or joking in other factories in more peaceful places might be about football teams or you yeah. know whose daughter is getting you know married or whatever, um, and it's that must mark you as a, especially as a teenager, to grow up in a place where like those kind of events are just daily occurrences, but also are kind of background dark humor. Yeah, and I think the gallows humor that maybe people associate with places like this, and Northern Ireland is a good example. Um, it's a coping mechanism, for one thing, and it's a sort of, a, it's a callus, maybe, um, that's kind of hardened over time. Uh, and things don't seem that shocking if, you know, you're living with basically the, the remainders of, you know, a 30-year war where 3,700 people were killed, uh, which means that a pretty sizable percentage, something like 10% of uh, of people in Northern Ireland have lost a family member. I think it's an awful lot of people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the book I talk about how unprocessed trauma like that, you know, in any other place, you know, if you randomly knew someone whose family member was killed, you'd be like, wow, jeepers, I don't even know how you get over that. Okay, that's 10% of Northern Ireland. That's like the background home. And that's family members. That's not your best friend. That's not your colleague. 
you know, any of those other things. And to some extent, Northern Ireland is paradoxical because it's off, often levelled at Northern Irish people that we talk about it all the time, whereas I kind of think we don't talk about it enough, really. Yeah. Um, we talk about it all the time, yeah. too. <laughs> or you only invite us to open our mouths when it is that exactly, topic. That yeah. just, again. Um, do you find that, because you live in London, I do. and you have for a number of years, uh, at the time of a political event in Brexit that has sort of catapulted your little corner of Derry, as you say, onto the border between the United Kingdom and the European Union in a way that obviously was not really, con whatever side of the debate you were on, was not at all considered in the debate. Yeah, over. but I, I basically got to write for The Guardian about it four or five times because it seemed like they didn't know anybody else who grew up on the border or who knew that it existed. I mean, I was reading people who's, who were who agreed with me on principle that it was a bad idea to, you know, to kind of for, for Brexit to happen and for certainly for the border to be disregarded. But they were still talking about it like it was a hypothetical thing. It's like, no, the people live on that. Like, you can't re-erect... It's, it's literally my dad's fence. Yeah. yeah. And well, not only that, but like the customs hut that was burnt, that was blown up, that's now like a five-bedroom home. And very nice, too. And the one across the road with the, the Irish uh, customs hut, uh, that's now a kickboxing gym. Oh. So you're going to have to kick a lot of very oiled Donegal men out of there and put up a new place. You're going to have to staff it. You're going to have to put... And all these kinds of things. It, it wasn't just that people hadn't thought about it. They hadn't thought about thinking about it, you know? And I think all of, it's kind of maddening, I think, because particularly in British political culture, there's, there is, it's less of an ignorance as much as just a complete complacency about the lived truths of other people, even those people who are technically in your country, not even technically, they literally are. Um, and it can be confusing and alarming to Northern Irish people, um, whether you identify as Irish or British, that Britain so often doesn't seem to think or know anything about you <laughs> to the point where you wonder, well, what, what are we all fighting about then? I mean, do you find, like, as a person from Northern Ireland living in the UK, and as you say, you've ended up writing about this a number of times in the press in a sort of like, mm. you know, if I say it very slowly kind of way, maybe they'll eventually get it. Yeah, and like, also, I... Uh, is it frustrating? It, it is frustrating. And the only way I could get out of the frustration was by joking about it. Mm. Because I think the other thing was that all of the commentary about this was extremely dry. And that was mainly because nobody had, uh, nobody felt like they had license to make jokes about it. Because uh, I think an English person would run a mile before they'd start uh, making jokes about what it's like to live on the Irish border. And probably for a good, uh, good reason. Uh, people from the South are slightly less um, picky about that. They seem to find a way to, to, to justify it to themselves. Um, but I think I do have license as an Northern Irish person. And so, you know, as I say in the book, one of, the, one of possibly the only good thing about being from Northern Ireland is you're not scared of Northern Irish people. All of them, anyway. Um, just some of them. <laughs> just, just, just the <laughs> ones, you know. Um, and I think by default there's this, there's this horror about offending or kind of stoking it as if they're just a mad bunch of, you know, maniacs. Um, or like celiac vegans, you know, anything you offer will offend kind of thing. Um, but th that's not the case. Yeah. You know, there's actually a very, very healthy, you know, activist culture in Northern Ireland. There's an awful lot of people who write beautifully. And particularly, I think it's fantastic. We're seeing so many writers of fiction and poetry and, you know, literary nonfiction who are exploring all this and who are talking about it from both sides of the house, as my dad would say. From both sides of the house, yeah. I mean, and, and quite a lot about Derry as well. I mean, you know, obviously the success of the TV show Derry Girls has kind of brought Derry to a wider, brought mm -hmm. Derry to a wider audience, as it were. I mean, as someone from Derry, do you feel that the image of Derry has changed because of that kind of cultural renaissance that, like, is putting it back on the map? Or do you still feel that, especially living in the UK, that there's a stereotyping of Northern Ireland that goes on? I mean, both things are definitely true. Um, but, I mean, in Britain, I don't think it's even stereotyping. It's just complete ignoring. It's like, oh, yeah, those guys. Well, there must be some EU debate on. Because we do, you don't hear anything about it. You don't hear anything about local politics, which very quickly becomes national politics if it goes, mm -hmm. you know, one way or the other. Um, but, I mean, things like, I mean, Dairy Girls, I think, is fantastic. I think the best thing about it is that it's, it shows the normality and the absurdity without cheapening either. Like, it's a good all-family sitcom that like, a five-year-old can love, a 30-year-old can love, and a seven-year-old can love. And that is really, really hard to do on any subject, in any place. And the fact that they did it 
with lots of sensitive stuff in there, but it's also really, really funny and really clever, and it has heart. And also, people from Derry don't often like things that are about Derry. It's a high bar. Well, there's a bit of tall poppy to syndrome. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, you know, you'll kind of... You want Derry people really, really like, you know, local story done good, but if the focus is too much about, you know, a wider, a wider thing, you know... How, I, how have you found the reaction to your own book when people talk, because like in the book you do talk about that, the reaction of like us, oh, you're writing a book, are you? Oh, yeah. this will be in the book. Will I be in the book? Like now that they have it there, obviously when you talk to somebody who doesn't know where Derry is, it can be a literary thing in their mind. But for people who lived it, do you get, a, have you gotten a good reaction? Do you think that there's a bit of like, oh, he's, you know, he thinks he's above his station or whatever? Um, I am very above my station. So I should say <laughs> rightly so. so. Yeah. Um, no, the reaction has been astonishing. It's been astounding. I've been amazed because when I go back there, um, they're, they're just they're so excited about it. Um, I mean, it, it helps that every single one of those people that you mentioned, I just put them in the book. Um, so they're the ones who made the call. Everyone sees themselves like, oh, I like the book now. Um, but like the, the thing is as well, they also give you really funny feedback because they'll mention I have this whole big thing about a supermarket that's in, in Derry. And that's like everybody in Derry's favorite bit. I was like, so not the incredibly moving tribute to my dead mother. No, just me listing all the former names for a shop on, on the Strand Road. Um, so you can't predict these things, but I think because I think because the book is mostly about me with everything else in the background, yeah. people can insert themselves into it. Um, it does dip into sort of slightly more grandiose or broader themes, but for the most part, it's as self-obsessed as a six-year-old child and a seven-year-old child. And, you know, you know, it's very arrogant to write a, a memoir of any type at the age of, I think, 32 when I started reading. But like, it's not just a memoir of you. And I do think that like, what's really interesting is the fact that you've written a book that like a large part of it is your, not only a large part of the story of you as a child is about your father, but a lot of the story of you writing the book is about your relationship with your father, because he is in some ways the, the, the font of knowledge, the, the fact checker telling you, no, you didn't, we didn't have that car in 1991 or like yeah. these kind of details that like he remembers. And you became a father yourself in recent years. And how have you found like your relationship with your father and your relationship about writing this book influenced by your own experience of becoming a father and becoming a parent as well as somebody who grew up mm. most of your childhood without a mother. How have you found that experience of being a parent affects the way that you look back on this story? Uh, massively. So most of the book was written after I'd uh, had my son. Um, and I think one thing was you kind of get, you think slightly deeper also, you're sleep deprived, so maybe you're getting that sort of woozy half state of kind of thoughtfulness that comes in. Um, you become more sentimental, absolutely. And also, there's, you know, the elephant in the room is I'm now a parent. My dad, my son is marching ever closer every day to that age when I lost my mum. And it makes you think about it. It makes you think about it from their point of view. You know, the whole time growing up, I was so aware of what I was going through. And I was then slowly, you know, kind of was aware of what my family were going through and thinking from their point of view. And then from my father's point of view of, you know, le losing the love of his life and, and what he had to go through, even just logistically, you know, he's on a single wage, he's got 11 kids. You know, that took a little bit longer. Uh, as a child, you don't think about those things. So it was only really until I started reading the book that I thought, I thought about how this was for my mother. Because she, you know, it's terrible terrible to admit this but I'd never really properly put myself in in her head as someone who knew she was dying and that she would not you know grow up to see her children I mean it's it's too horrifying an idea to even think about and then to worry you know will they be okay you know and like I've been saying before that I find the book mostly pretty easy to write and you know put in loads of jokes and stuff it was the days when I knew I had to dig into that stuff where I was like I'm going to take this slow because Certainly not that I've had my own son. You know, you can't, it's, it's like staring into the sun. It's, it's, just, it's just too hard. And then to think that she went through that and then my father went through that and everything else. You start to rethink maybe some of the more glib and flippant jokes that you have in the book and you start moving them around and maybe kind of carving out. And those are kind of considerations that I probably might not have made if I'd written the book five years ago. Mm -hmm. And it was just like, you know, far be it for me to say my mother's death was actually a sad thing. Um, it, it deepened things. It made things a little bit more more earned, I think, because you start to think about loss in a much, much deeper way when you can actually imagine 
from the other end of the thing. Yeah. It's an amazing story. Thank you so much for sharing it with us and thank you so much for joining us in Dingle, Seamus O'Reilly. Thank you for having me.